This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Hey noble ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking and as people with a strong interest towards history, have you ever stopped to ask yourself how much harder would have life been for people in the past, particularly when you stop to think about all the different modern commodities that we have, are used to, uh, to be honest, take for granted. From public transportation to the weather forecast, to computers, to more computers that just pretend to be phones, the modern world has given us people of the present many ways to make our lives more comfortable, particularly when compared to people in the past. Hunter-gatherers risk their lives just to get lunch. We just go to the nearest supermarket and complain if they sold out that specific brand of cereal we like. Oh my god, how am I going to survive the five minutes drive to the other supermarket down the road? Now compare that with spending an entire day in a forest with a flint spear. However, there are many things we oftentimes call modern, such as, say, optical illusions or dental hygiene, which in fact existed in ancient times, which means that by definition they are not modern per se, as a general concept. What we have now is just a more advanced version of something that has been with us humans for a very long time. Well, today I've gathered 10 very surprising modern things that ancient Romans had. Number 10. Postal Service. Hey, will you look at that? I've got a package here. Luckily, in the modern era, we've got functioning postal services. By the way, if you want to know what this is, check out my Patreon page. Link in the description. Shameless plug. I wonder if the Romans had those. Actually, the ancient Romans had a fully functioning postal service that, in many ways, was quite similar to what we have now. It was called Cursus Publicus in Latin, and it was introduced by Emperor Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. Augustus. It consisted of designated stop stations placed near main roads and important communication routes. Inside these stations you had a series of slaves that functioned as messengers who could walk or run to the nearest station to deliver messages, letters, parcels, etc. With time, these stations obtained stables, horses and their own supply of horse feed. Imagine it this way, you had a certain territory within which the Roman Postal Service would function, would operate. Now you had many of these stations, the actual term for these stations is mutationes or mansiones, and these are two different kinds. The mansiones were actually the bigger one, and you would have one for every six mutationes. The ones that I've just described are the mutationes, the regular stations. Well, what's different about these ones here is the fact that these were not only bigger, but the messengers could actually spend the night, they could sleep, which is why you would have one every six. Now, you know how today we also have the option to use, say, private senders to deliver letters and packages, I don't know, mailboxes, etc., FedEx. Well, the ancient Romans also had this possibility. You generally speaking had two options, either give your letter or package to a merchant that you know is going to the city where you want your package or letter delivered to, for a price, or you assign the duty to one of your slaves. So basically, if you know, if you are the owner of land and slaves, you can use one of your slaves. You don't necessarily need to use the sort of public postal service. Although, of course, the slave could be killed, in which case, you know, it is what it is. Pretty impressive, isn't it? And you know what else people of the classical period had? Computers! Look at that! USB ports and whatnot, they even had their own VPNs. No, they didn't. I'm joking. That's not a computer. They did not have VPNs, but you should, such as Atlas VPN, that is the kind sponsor for today's video. 
A VPN is a virtual private network that makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted channel and this way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, it hides your IP address and online activities. Atlas VPN is a great choice because it was developed by cyber security specialists and, among other things, it gives you access to the data breach monitor, which is a security feature designed to track any data breaches related to your online accounts, automatically scanning any leaked information. But another add-on through Atlas VPN is the fact that you can use Netflix from any country regardless of where you are. So let's say you wanted to watch a show that they only broadcast in the UK, but you were in America. No problem, just change your country through the VPN and boom, access granted. I personally always have Atlas VPN active on my machines because one account lets you use unlimited devices. Not only Atlas VPN is a great choice, but it's also a very affordable one. Now today is the perfect day to start using Atlas VPN because it's the deal of the year. Atlas VPN is offering all of you a Steel Black Friday deal, which means that now you can get Atlas VPN Premium for just $1.70 per month, plus 6 months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you have been considering getting a VPN but you weren't sure about the prices, well, now is the time. Only $1.70 per month, plus 6 months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Since this is just a limited time offer, make sure to be quick, click the link in the description below, get your deal. And big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring my channel. Number 9. Materials. Now hear me out, because things are going to get really interesting here. Obviously, whenever we think of the materials that ancient people had access to, clearly, if you compare it to the sort of materials we've got in our day and age, yes, there are a lot of things that they didn't have access to. For example, clearly, the Romans didn't have plastics and they did not have, here it is, titanium. This is a cube of pure titanium here. They would have friggin' loved this one. And whenever we think of the classical period, which is after the Iron Age, we think, we, yeah, of course, they had iron, they had copper, bronze, that kind of material, wood, stone. But check this out. There are some materials that you probably would expect to also be modern that they actually had, and that might surprise you. So let me tell you three. The ancient Romans had access to plywood, concrete, and steel. So how do we define plywood? Well, technically plywood is a material manufactured from thin layers of wood. These layers are glued together with adjacent layers having their wood grain rotated. Polybius, Roman writer, does give us some very interesting descriptions on how they built shields, particularly in the Republican period, and then we have got, of course, the material evidence that we can compare it to. And many Roman shields were in fact made by overlapping layers of thin wood placed at a different orientation to increase their strength. When it comes to Roman concrete, of course it's different in its ingredients and fundamental materials to modern concrete, but it still is concrete. Modern concrete is typically made with Portland cement, a mixture of silica sand, limestone clay, chalk and other ingredients, but Roman concrete was a mixture of volcanic ash, lime and seawater. This was done in order to take advantage of a chemical reaction which the Romans not only had observed naturally but also understood in tough rocks, in other words, cemented ash deposits. The Romans created a rock-light concrete that thrives in open chemical exchange with seawater. Last but not least, steel, sometimes a little bit of a nomenclature battle, but in general we can all agree that iron, with the addition of a certain percentage of carbon, turns into steel. The steel that the Romans used wasn't as advanced as the one used, for example, in the late Middle Ages, but we know that they used it understanding the process behind it. And I think this myth of the idea that steel wasn't available until the modern era is more of a misunderstanding of steel itself, which has been around since the Iron Age, and the mass production of steel, which indeed is a modern thing. Number eight, beware of the dog. So you know how we people keep dogs in our home? Well, the Romans did it too, as pets. See, you could be a Roman. Dogs were considered domestic animals that people liked having in their homes, for affection, but also for protection. And this connects to our fun fact. Are you gonna protect me? Yeah, good luck with that. You wouldn't scare a chicken, because you're a piscottino. Piscottino. You know signs like this one, beware of the dog, that some people put outside of their houses or near the gates of their yards? Well, the Romans did it too. The Romans often placed cawe canem. The Romans distinguished the following types of dogs, guard, hunting, luxury, fighting and shepherd dogs. And each class had its recommended breed, size and even colour. For example, black dogs were usually supposed to be or recommended to be used as guard dogs. Number 7. 
dental hygiene. Yeah, this one is going to gross you out. In our day and age, we're all about dental hygiene, or at least we're all encouraged to be. From dental clinics to toothpaste, toothbrushes, controversial mouthwashes, we've got it all. But surely enough, the Romans cared about the health of their teeth, the freshness of their breath, and the whiteness of their smile as well. That's all good and dandy, but wait until you hear how they did it. The Romans used animal or human urine to whiten their teeth. Yeah. I'll choose yellow teeth any day of the week. Number six, underwear. Most often than not, the Romans are represented in either their very characteristic tunics or their very sumptuous formal togas. But have you ever stopped to wonder what's underneath all of those tunics? You kinky muppet. Well, have a look at these representations here. They look quite modern once you think about it, don't they? Indeed, the Romans wore undergarments and underwear. There were even regulations for, for example, gladiators that they were expected to be wearing underwear. You know, we're here for a spectacle. Not that kind, though. As we can see from this image, women often liked exercising in underwear. Of course, both the material and the look would have been different from modern ones, but the idea of wearing underwear, absolutely not modern. Number five, Latin profanities. Now, check this one out. Normally, whenever we imagine the way the ancient Romans talked, we have this idea of this very powerful, sophisticated, educated, aristocratic, even powerful, authoritative language that is classical Latin. That, of course, also existed, but it is also important to understand that that does not represent the entirety of what Latin sounded like all the time, everywhere. Imagine that there is a natural disaster, and all video and audio footage of how English sounds in our day and age is completely erased, except for the recordings of university professors and their lectures. And then in about 2000 years, people imagine they give you that as the only example they have. And then the reason why that's not really a realistic way to imagine how people on the streets trying to buy lunch sounded like is because even in English, um, the way a professor speaks during a lecture is full of terminology, grammar, syntax, intonation that don't represent the way you talk to your friends when you play Call of Duty. Latin could also be vulgar as a spoken, alive language. And believe it or not, not only the Romans really liked profanities, but their favorite ones were the sexual-based ones. Number four, optical illusions. Who doesn't love a nice optical illusion? It freaking makes your brain blow up. In our day and age, these are the prerogative of science vlogs, very talented artists, and the like of Vsauce. And that might give us the wrong impression that optical illusion were also a sort of scientific discovery that is modern. Well, it wasn't. In the classical period, they oftentimes used optical illusions in a very ingenious way, not only as a form of decoration in the sense that, hey, check this out, if you look at it from here, it's gonna look different. They also use it as a way to correct architectural features that would otherwise look odd. That's smart. Number three, running water. Clean water is not unusual today, especially in developed countries. Tap or faucet in the bathroom, in your kitchen, every day you don't even think about it. Unlimited amounts of water for personal and private use. Not even that expensive. Readily available supply of clean water? It must be a modern thing. Uh, no. Ancient Rome was really impressive. Whenever we think of the English word aqueduct, well, it actually comes from the Latin aqueductus, water line. Generally, an aqueductus will be used to transport water to a Roman city from a natural spring, which most often was coming from a mountain. They were built according to the principle of continuous drainage. The capital city of Rome is probably the most impressive one since the city, with its one million inhabitants, had 11 aqueducts that were totaling 420 kilometers of water supply. And what you might not know is that only 47 kilometers of which were above Earth's surface. Imagine that kind of construction. This sophisticated network was able to provide one million cubic meters of water to Rome every day. So what was this water used for? Fountains, wealthier homes and properties, baths and public toilets. Even some relatively cheap houses could have access to running water, but normally it was just the ground floors. So people living on the second, third, fourth floor would not have access to running water, which is why higher floors were cheaper. Number two lighthouses. Now, of course, there is a very long story of development when it comes to lighthouses. In the early forms were nothing but controlled fires on hilltops near the coastlines to warn ships that there were 
approaching land. Now, not only the Romans did know how to make lighthouses, but did you know that the oldest still working, still functioning lighthouse in the world is indeed, you guessed it, Roman, and it's in Spain. It's called the Tower of Hercules. It is the only Roman lighthouse that has survived to our time. Originally, it was 37 meters high, and this height has been preserved since antiquity. In the 18th century, the tower's height was expanded to 68 meters. Still, the 37 meters high tower for the times of the Roman would have been one of the tallest buildings that they had ever erected. It contained three floors, four rooms on each floor. Now, how did they achieve the illumination? The illumination was achieved with a large stone oil lamp. Of course, that alone wouldn't have been enough, therefore the light was amplified through reflection by polished surfaces. Number one, microorganisms. Now, I left best for last, so first of all, thank you for reaching this part of the video and putting up with me, but be ready to have your mind blown because this is gonna be like... <coughs> the Romans knew about bacteria. We usually learn in school that it was in the 19th century when researchers saw microorganisms under microscopes, and that's true. And also that the idea of bacteria goes back to the 17th century. But if you've ever read the De Re Rustica, written by Marcus Terentius Warro, your opinion might change. He writes, Precautions must also be taken in the neighborhood of swamps, both for the reasons given and because there are bred certain minute creatures which cannot be seen by the eyes, which float in the air and enter the body through the mouth and nose, and there cause serious diseases. How did Waro know? At the end of the day, he did say that the creatures were not visible. Perhaps that might remain a mystery, at least for now. All right, number ones, well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up. And if you are not yet members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Don't forget to take advantage of the amazing Black Friday offer from Atlas VPN through the link in the description. Thank you very much for watching. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.